All right. So this is the last part of our series. Because for the next couple weeks, I want to get into some... I feel like there's some really serious topic discussions that we, we need to have as a church. And if uh, people aren't here for it, then we'll send it out. But there's some serious topics that we need to we need to send out to help people because this is a really hard and depressing time period. So we can't get out there and and, uh, and, and unload our emotions. And uh, there's a lot of things that we used to do for fun we can't do right now because of this COVID stuff. And the end result is that people are locked up in their homes with abusive people and uh, we just are going nuts, uh, some of us. Not that I'm in an abusive home. <laughs> but my point is that we need to incur be encouraged. And so we have some messages designed for that coming up. Um, unless God changes those, which he does sometimes. Okay, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 12, if you have a Bible handy there. Mark chapter 12. Mark, the 12th chapter. And I, I just want to say that a lot is going on here in the Bible in Mark chapter 12. Jesus has been arguing, uh, well, uh, Jesus has been making some very powerful points with the scribes and the Pharisees in his day, with his disciples and apostles as they're traveling into Jerusalem. There's been some very powerful discussions with these men. Now we drop into these verses, and this is what we're going to talk about today. Beginning in verse 41. Mark chapter 12 and verse 41. Everybody stand, if you can, for the first verse. This first opening text. And this is what we read there in Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury and many that were rich cast in much and there came a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites which make a, a farthing and he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. And all they did cast in their abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Okay, you can relax and have a seat. So we've talked about integrity. We've talked about patience. Today, we're going to talk about a quality that we can put into practice because it seems like everybody right now is challenged with what they don't have. COVID has taken its toll on all of us, um, cutting our work hours. Uh, people are struggling with unemployment. I've seen a, a news article that, uh, uh, that, that, that some of the states are, are uh, charging people back for unemployment that they've paid out. Um, so this is a difficult time. So we're going to apply this to what the times that we're living. I couldn't believe when I read this headline, but this was an actual headline. Where a man said, I want the last check I write to bounce. So the first thought there is, uh, the comment that this man made is uh, from a guy who can't manage his business accounts. Spends every dime on what he has, doesn't realize that there's more in life than spending and get it. But the initial reaction to that comment that this man made, I had it wrong. His name is Charles F. Feeney. He is at least, or used to be, a billionaire. He made his fortune in the duty-free shopping industry. He made a decision in 1984, which he kept a secret and formed a private foundation called Atlantic Philanthropies. You'll see why this applies in a second. For 15 years, he ran it anonymously, even though it was one of the largest sources of charitable grants in the United States, Ireland, South Africa, and Vietnam. He secretly turned over the duty-free business to this foundation and continued to invest while giving money away in direct medical care, education, criminal justice advocacy, and peace-building initiatives. 
Atlanta Philanthropies will, uh, will, will this year close their doors and gave away eight billion dollars. Gave away eight billion dollars and would be by far the largest organization to have voluntarily shut itself down. Mr. Feeney says that he understands that personal prosperity is for the purpose of purposeful generosity. How often do you see an attitude like that? Very, very little, right? So we're in a series called uh, This Self-Analysis of Ourselves. This mirror image. And we're looking in the mirror. We've been looking at different qualities um, that affect our character. Imagine that you had a mirror. You could look at it, and it would show you not only what you look like on the outside, but what you look like on the inside. That's what we're trying to do, is to see what it is that we look like inside. What would you see in your heart? That kind of character, what would it be? Today we're going to talk about one of the traits that probably comes the hardest to us, but it is one of the evidences that your character is what it ought to be, and that trait is generosity. Generosity. In all my years of living, which has somehow turned into quite a few years, in my years of living, I've never met a selfish, greedy person that I would say is of high character. A selfish, greedy person. I thought, uh, I think there was a man that I, I used to know, I'm not going to tell you who he is. Back in California, when I lived in California, I knew um, of a man. And uh, people that know me well might know who he is. But in many ways, uh, he was a hoarder, he was selfish, and he was greedy, and he had tons of money. I remember one time he told me, Steve, if I wanted to, I could buy a plane right now. He said, I have so much money, I can do anything I want right now. But frankly, in many ways, he was miserable, and he made those around him miserable. I don't know if he could even spell generosity. But I remember seeing him outside with a bottle of wine, drinking wine by his truck. Very sad and very alone. He portrays the same three traits that I see in every person who I've ever met who is selfish and greedy. He is insecure, worries about his health, and money all the time. He's insensitive to the needs of others and it never occurs to him how much of a blessing he could be to those around him. He's inconsiderate of the feelings of others because of greed, selfishness, which is the opposite of generosity and has a way of turning our hearts cold. I think most of us know somebody like that. Today we're going to look at a story about Jesus that is so remarkable, first of all, because it even made it into the Bible, and also because it, it didn't involve a miracle. There was no miraculous healing in this story. The reason the story is so phenomenal is because of what Jesus saw and what Jesus said. What Jesus said was so remarkable, because what Jesus saw was so refreshing. He saw the greatest example of generosity anyone has ever witnessed. A generous person is the epitome of what generosity is all about. Let's just say a quick prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to hear this message of generosity as Jesus seen it happen before us. And as we review it together, we pray that you'll do a miracle in somebody's life and heart as they look in on this story, as we reflect on this mirror image of ourselves and which qualities can help us today the most. We leave it in your care, dear God, that you take it over. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to put yourself in the story. Okay? I want you to put yourself in this story. Because what is true about this person in Jesus is true about you in Jesus. It is true about what you have and what you think you have 
and what you do with what you have. Jesus saw something that no one else that day saw. Though everyone was seeing the same thing he saw. And we opened with the scripture and the verses. We realized that Jesus went to the temple. You will see that nobody else sees things quite like Jesus. In ways nobody else would ever think about. It's really kind of an amazing special story. The woman that is talked about here in this story does something that to, to our eyes seems so ordinary and so small and so unimportant, so inconsequential that nobody would have given it thought except for Jesus. In fact, only one person left that day talking about it. Only one person. Because Jesus did talk about it. We are all still talking about it some 2,000 years later. If Jesus would have never said a word about what he's seen, we wouldn't be learning about it today. So I want you to see yourself in this story because what was true about this woman is true about you and me. What is true about her is, is quite possibly true about you and what you have. Jesus must have been really bored that day. He must not have had much to do. You know, it's a slow day. Uh, so Jesus decides, you know, he says, uh, I'm going to go down to the temple. And I'm just going to sit there and I'm just going to watch people putting their offering in the basket. That's what he did. The Bible says in Mark chapter 12, which we read, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. So this story goes way deeper than uh, our offering here at church. We're talking about how we view the things that we have and what we give God. This is so much deeper than imagining that we're giving an offering here. And so I, I want you to think about what Jesus is seeing and what this woman does. When you walk into the temple, there was a certain section of the temple where the offerings were received. And Jesus, he purposely got a front row seat. You imagine Jesus walking into a temple. He walks through this crowd. Um, this particular uh, temple here in Jerusalem happened to be in a very popular area, so there was, it was, there was a lot of prominence there. Jesus walks in, walks to the front, finds a, a front row seat where he could watch what people gives. Kind of, kind of different to think about, isn't it? Whenever Jesus was teaching or performing a miracle, normally Jesus wanted everyone else to have a front row seat. This is the only time we're ever told that Jesus looked for the front row seat. I could understand if it was a football game. You know, something exciting, or maybe a play or a concert, wanting to be in the front. But this was an offering. What is he doing? And here he sits in the front row. And he's just watching people. How many people like to watch people? Sometimes I do. <laughs> Today it would be considered rude to do what Jesus did. You would have thought... This is maybe sticking his nose into other people's business. Maybe. A busybody. Newsflash, though. Jesus still watches the offering. Jesus still sees what we give and what we don't. Right? Okay. As a matter of full disclosure, I'm not real concerned about knowing what people give. I don't want to know what you give. And uh, there is a certain honesty among pastors that, uh, that aren't keeping track. And that, 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 that they'll accept that offering and then... Uh, Give you that up amongst the bills to take care of the church. Um, but, but I don't want to know. Uh, that uh, I feel it's, uh, it's between you and God what you give. Right? True. But, but don't breathe too easy. Because Jesus does. Jesus does. I just want you to think about this. Jesus does watch what we give. Whether it's the offering. Or whether it's what we're putting out. In our service to him. Jesus is watching. He does not find it boring at all to sit and watch you. 
The treasury was a public place of deposit for the money that people gave to the temple. It was really fascinating to watch. Um, so it was a fascinating kind of a thing. There were 13 brass treasure chests called trumpets. 13 brass treasure chests called trumpets. I want you to just try to picture this in your mind, what it might have looked like. They looked like trumpets, these treasure chests. They were shaped like inverted horns, okay? They were narrow at the top and large at the bottom. And in particular, rich people would throw the coins in in such a way that they would go around, around, and around, and make this loud ringing sound so that everybody would hear and see it, and everybody would know that they'd given a lot of money. Okay? So now, can you picture that? So Jesus is just watching. And we're told in verse 41 that the rich threw in large amounts. They did have to guess that the rich gave a lot. The rich were able to give a lot. And you could see it. And you could hear it. In fact, they used to call it sounding the trumpet. Sounding the trumpet. Throwing the coins in. Making the noise. And then the money would drop. That's where the expression sounding the trumpet came from. Jesus was very observant. He was anticipating what people were giving. He knew exactly how much everybody was putting in. Jesus knew. He was well aware that the rich people were putting in large sums of money. Now understand, Jesus is not condemning the rich for giving the money. He loves a cheerful giver, whether uh, the giver is a rich giver or a poor giver. He's not questioning their motives of these rich people. There are rich people who give with a good heart and good motives. Some of the greatest charitable work being done in the world today is done by rich people. And that's good. But the point that Mark here in the Bible is making here is that the Lord anticipates. He anticipates what we give. He is marking down what we give. He is taking note and paying attention to what we give. Whether it's the offer or whether it's our service. What are we doing for God? He's paying attention. Just like he paid attention that day. And that's a very important point. That while others in the church aren't paying attention to you, Jesus is. Okay? Um... So, he knows what we give, or as I said, when we don't give. Or when we're not offering anything. But that's not the real point of the story. Okay? The story would have never made it in, in the Gospels. Um, we would have never known about this story if it stopped in verse 1. Because there was nothing unusual about the first verse. It's what happens next that catches Jesus' attention. Yes, he's making this, this observance in the tabernacle. Something caught his eye, and his head turned. In chapter 12 and verse 42, it says that a poor widow came in and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Talk about an unlikely hero she was. She would have been looked upon that day as a three-time loser by a lot of others. She was poor. She was a widow. They would have known it because uh, widows wore distinctive clothing back then. Third, she was a woman. And as much as I hate to tell you this, uh, in some ways, women at that time were considered second-class citizens compared to men. So, that may have been how others might have seen her, but that's not how Jesus seen her. You could say, really, that she made the front page of Jesus' newspaper. Jesus is watching so closely that he sees something no one else saw. With his supernatural spiritual vision and insight, he sees her put in two small copper coins. They were called mites. That's what these coins were called, mites. They were very small, smaller than a penny. A mite didn't have a lot of mite. <laughs> it's just real tiny. 
These coins were the smallest and least valuable pieces of money in circulation that day. That's how much she put into the offering. The average daily wage of a common labor back then was 15 cents for a day. The two coins put together were equivalent to about one one hundredth of that amount. In fact, it was less than one tenth of one cent. One tenth of one cent. And that is who caught Jesus' attention. These coins were the smallest and most least valuable pieces of money in circulation. The average, the average, uh, the average daily wage shows that uh, you know she she didn't have much. He was so impressed with what she did that he calls the disciples over to see what she had done. He probably got up from his front row seat, turned around, called them over to him. He makes this statement that I promise, I promise we made the disciples question Jesus grades in math and school. This is what he said. He calls them to him and he says, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more money into the treasury than all the others. Since I'm a student of accounting myself, I will be the first one to tell you that maybe math wasn't Jesus' best subject at school. Because she couldn't have put in more than the others. But that wasn't the point, was it? The bottom line is the point. The bottom line is the bottom line, and there's no way that one-tenth of a penny could be more than what all those rich people were putting in together. Now we learn the lesson about generosity, and this is our lesson. The most generous givers do not necessarily always give the largest gifts. True? Simply put, generosity is not always measured by what you give. There is a difference between giving the greatest amount and being the most generous giver. A million dollars may be a dream gift, but a tenth of a penny just might make you a dream giver. A tenth of a penny. It did for Jesus. You talk about generosity. You don't get a pass if you're not rich. If you're not rich, that doesn't mean Jesus doesn't want to see you give. Jesus doesn't say, hey, if you're poor, this doesn't apply to you. I'm not going to watch for you. No, Jesus seen her. So Jesus sees, sees all of us and the potential of being dream givers. You don't get a pass if you don't have nearly as much money as the next guy. What this poor widow teaches us is, well... You don't have to be rich to be generous. You don't have to have a lot to give. And you don't have to have a lot to give a lot. Right? So Jesus doesn't measure what people give the way we measure what people give. He doesn't look at the portion that people give. Jesus looked at the proportion of what people give. He didn't look at how much people put on the table. Jesus looked at how much people left in their pockets. How much they left in their pocket. We look at what is put in. Jesus looks at what is left over. That's the difference between generosity. Do you see that? Okay. One of these days we're going to find that some of the most generous people who ever have lived were some of the poorest people that we ever knew. Jesus is not impressed with the greatness of what you give, but the generosity of what we give. I can think of one person in my head who I would say is one of the most generous givers, an exemplary giver of our modern time here in the church. And you're probably thinking of the same guy. You want to take a shot at it? Pastor Ron. Our, our Pastor Ron. True? Mm -hmm. While we're discussing this, I want you to think of how we can apply this to living through these COVID months. Okay? Are you kind of doing that a little bit? You'll be able to apply this at the end. I want you to go back to that day at the temple. In your mind. And see Jesus there. And hear the noises of the coins. I want you to see that moment when Jesus stops. And he turns around and he looks at his disciples. And he calls them over. And he has this discussion. Everybody applauded what the rich people were given. Only one person applauded what the poor widow gave.
it kind of breaks my heart because it was so important for her to give. And if you can really see that moment of how she must have felt to make her way through the crowd and to give her two mites. It's a little heartbreaking because you know she wanted to get more. And Jesus, he could read her heart. So all this applause that the rich were giving each other, but it was the applause of the only one that mattered that was given to her from Jesus. Jesus watches her. Jesus watches. Jesus sees. He calculates what we give, not by how much we put on the table, but how much we leave in our pocket. Not by how much the gift was worth, but how much the gift really costed you. By that measure, this poor little widow that day got an A plus in generosity. Does that make sense? Of what God sees? Let me give you an example. I'm going to use the offering because this is my thought process. When we come in and we're thinking about the offering and what we can give to the church. And you think to yourself, okay, I've got this here. Now if I put this much in the offering, that's only going to leave me with this much. And I could really use this much over here for this. I'd really like to do this. And so I'm just going to do this for the offering. How much am I keeping in my pocket? That's what Jesus sees. That's what he sees. Right? That's what Jesus is seeing. And that's what makes us generous. This poor little widow becomes the hero of a story she didn't even know she was writing. She, uh, Jesus sums up why he was so enamored with the little woman who, who gave such a, a big, uh, such a big gift in his view. Now in Matthew chapter 12, verse 44, uh, as a reminder, we read it, this is what it said. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Oh. Once again, we're reminded of how poor she was. <laughs> After calling her poor, she is now described as being a person of poverty, and two complete, complete Greek words are used for poor and poverty. The first word, translated as poor, describes someone who is totally at destitute, a beggar. She may very well have been homeless. It's very possible she could have been homeless. Today she would have been totally dependent on public assistance or whatever, on help from others. The second word for poverty means basically having nothing. A careful reading says that she really gave more than just two mites, right? She gave more than just two mites. How much did she give? Everything. She, she gave everything. Jesus said she put in everything she had to live on. What that literally means is she gave all, all of her, all of her, literally, meaning she gave all of her life. This lady was not only giving her money, she was giving herself. She was not only giving all that she had, she was giving all that she was. The reason why this woman could give all of her money to God was because she had already given all of her life to God. We're going to explain that in a second. But as you put this story together and you see what this, this giving amount that, that she gave meant for her, it meant so much. But why could we say that she had given her life to God? Well, the easy part for this woman was giving all her money. That wasn't hard for her because she had given to God all of her heart. What really impressed Jesus was not what she gave, but why she gave it. Okay? So now we, we're not getting lost here in how much you're going to give in your next offering or how much you're doing for Jesus. Don't get it. What we're talking about is her attitude that really impressed Jesus as he read her and watched her. It was her attitude. Keep in mind, she was not going to get a tax deduction like the rich, you know, today when they make a, 
a donation, they get a tax deduction. She wasn't going to get one of those. She didn't, uh, she didn't uh, give out a show for others. Not only did she not, not know that anyone was really looking, she probably would have been embarrassed if somebody was looking. She, 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 she for sure didn't give flippantly. She wasn't casual. For the moment, she carefully thought this through. This was no little thing for her to walk in and do this. She didn't say it out loud that she was uh, making a clear statement to God. Her actions spoke louder than words, and did, did her actions ever speak loudly and clearly? Because she gave everything that she had. She was saying three things. She was saying three things. God, I look to you to provide for me. God, I love you more than I love money. And God, I live for you and you alone. Have you ever walked in and, uh, and really didn't have much money at all? And you gave it all to the offering? Oh, right? Oh, let's see. It. I've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I've only got 20 bucks. If you've done that, you might be able to understand how she felt. Right? Yeah. Okay. She was going to rely on God and knew she could trust Him to take care of her and provide for her because she was generous herself. Right? This is the time I want to ask two groups of people to answer an honest question <laughs> to yourselves. If you do give to the Lord's work, if you are practicing generosity, why do you? Why do you? Why do you do it? Remember, we're looking at ourselves. You see, the IRS doesn't care what you give. They just want their money. The mortgage company doesn't care what you give. They just want their money. The credit card company doesn't care what you give. They just want their money. God cares why you give. He doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. You want your heart, right? Amen. An even bigger question to, frankly, a bigger group of people is to those who don't give. Ask yourselves this question. Why don't you give? As I have already stated before, well, I can't afford to give. And you might say that. I can't afford to give. If you're honest, we, we would say, uh, you know, we just, uh, we just can't afford it. And... Uh, Maybe we don't want to do without this new thing or that new thing. Maybe, if we're honest with ourselves, maybe that's why we don't give. If you have enough to feed yourself and close yourself and put a roof over your head somewhere and you have anything left over, just be honest enough to admit it is either because you don't look to God to provide for your needs or you don't love God more than money. i, I, I got to say this. It's not that we don't understand hard times, but there is always a sacrifice we can give to Jesus. There is always a sacrifice that you can give to Jesus. Amen? Amen? All of those things really mean this. What you are really saying is, it doesn't belong to Him. It belongs to me. That's what you're saying to God. I just want to give you an illustration. I just heard this before, this morning. Um, when I was younger, on Father's Day, I would always want to do something for my dad. But I never had any money. I was just a little kid. And so when it got closer to Father's Day, I would say, Hey, Mom, can you get a few dollars from Dad so that I can get him something for Father's Day? <laughs> right? Have you ever done that with your children? Maybe at Christmas you give him a few dollars so they get you a gift. Or uh, on a birthday. It's Dad's birthday. And so the kid says, Hey, Dad, can I have a few dollars? I want to get you something for your birthday. Right? I want you to think about the mentality about your relationship with God. God owns everything. Amen. And you say, uh, Dear God, please help us, uh, provide for us, take care of us, give us what we need. And then we take those things that God gives us, and we're blessed with things, and what do we do back? It's all His anyway, we give it back to Him. That is a generous spirit. It's easy to see that with our parents, but we have to put that into perspective with God and our relationship with him today. 
Today we're talking about a poor widow. We do not know her name. We don't know where she came from. We don't know where she lived. And we do not know how she died. 2,000 years later, though, we still remember her and we talk about her because she was generous. You are not going to be remembered by how much you make, how much you spent, or how much you saved. Nobody will remember those things about you. Nobody's going to know how much you saved or care when you are gone. Nobody's going to remember that about you. What will they remember about you? Well, they're going to be, you will be remembered for how much you gave. Amen? Amen. So, you're not going to be rewarded by God for how much you made, or how much you spent, or how much you saved. You will be rewarded by what you gave. The woman, she never knew that Jesus saw her. She never heard what Jesus said about her. But I guarantee you, and I want you to think this, think of this. Because I really feel like this is what's going to happen. I guarantee you, the second she walks into heaven, the first thing Jesus is going to say to her is, I saw what you did. I saw you. She's going to say, what? And she's going to say, I, I saw you. <laughs> And I will guarantee you that every angel in heaven will rush up to her and say, so you're her. You're that one Jesus told us about. You are the little poor widow that gave all she had. I guarantee you that's what I feel is going to happen to her. And the greatest reason at all why all of us should be generous, whether we have a little or a lot is because our God has been generous with us. A God who is so generous that he did what? Well, he gave us his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross so that we might have the most expensive gift of all. Opportunity. Eternal life. And he gives it to you for free. He gives it to you for free. You only have one life to live. You're going to live it one of two ways. You're going to be a generous person or you're going to be a greedy person. You're either going to live life selflessly, holding, holding everything God has given you with an open hand, or you're going to live a life selfishly, holding everything God has given you with a closed fist. And that's why we're examining ourselves with this quality, generosity. On September 3rd, 1939, German troops invaded Bielsko, Poland. A 15-year-old girl, Gerda Weissman, and her family survived in the Jewish ghetto until June of 1942. That is when Gerda was taken from her mom and she was sent to a death camp while Gerda would spend three years in a concentration camp. She was one of the few survivors that survived the concentration camp. By the time she was liberated by American troops, she was a 68-pound skeleton, and later she married the soldier who rescued her. It's a nice story. At the Holocaust Memorial in Boston, Massachusetts, there are six glass towers representing the six extermination camps where six million Jews were killed. Five towers tell the story of the unbelievable cruelty that people endured, but the sixth tower stands as a testimony to generosity. The sixth tower. Inscribed on it is a short story entitled, One Raspberry, written by Gerda. And this is partly the story. A child friend of mine once found a raspberry in the camp and carried it in her pocket all day to present to me that present that night on a leaf. Imagine a world in which your entire possession is one raspberry and you save it all day to give it to your friend. That is generosity. That is generosity. The real measure of your heart is bound up in whether it is a heart that wants to get or a heart that wants to give. The real measure of the value of a gift is not how much it is worth on the table, but how much is left in your pocket. That's what makes generosity. That is true whether it is a million dollars, two copper coins, or one raspberry. 
When Jesus Christ came to this planet, he gave everything he had, including his life. He had nothing in the tank and nothing on the table. He gave his all for us, and we should give our all to him. Amen. So that's our last quality. When you think about generosity through these COVID restrictive months where people are really tight, how can we apply these things we've learned and show generosity to others? Any thoughts on that before we quit today? Be considerate. Okay, be considerate. Good. And, and, and when you think about others and what you have, you may have little, but you can still give to others. And there's a lot of ways to give. Can you give some ideas of how to give? Helping out. Like how? Well, if you know somebody's in need to help, like housework or something. Okay, good. Work. Yeah. You can help them with work. Which we could use some help. You guys work. <laughs> That's a great one. Um, Even food. If you food. Think extra. Bag of potatoes, right? Goes a long ways. Something. If you hear about something, give. Help. What if it's not uh, possessions or money? Uh, work, you said work. Uh, how else can we give? Time to God. Amen. Make time for God. This is the worst time for Christians in very many years because what we're finding is that the last thing people are doing is making time for Jesus. This is hard. Not only are we bombarded with issues with our families, but we're praying for God to help us, but how much are we leaving on the table? Right? Oh. We pray and we pray and we pray for God to help us and pray for others to help us. And others are praying for us. But how much do we leave in our pocket? How much are you giving God? Anything? So these are great things for us to think about right now because it is hard. And uh, God understands it's hard, so what is He going to do? In our case, He's going to help us. Okay? He's going to help us. He's going to help us. He's going to provide for us. When you think you're too stressed out because of living and the pressures of the day, God's going to help you through it. Put it first. He will help you through it. Pray to Him. Listen to your gospel music and sing songs of praise. And it will take you a long way. Amen?